reminded me, I reminded me when um, there was a, a beloved saint, Harold Rogers, was a leader church when I was growing up, and, and he, was, uh, he was a really good man, uh, very knowledgeable, and sometimes he would do the singing on Sunday nights, and I remember one time he decided we should be a little bit more enthusiastic, and this is Harold, and this is just how he did it, what this church needs is a little more enthusiastic. Um, yeah. Okay. So um, the deal is that I would had thought that I would like to talk today about what we need to know about the Bible. Okay. So it's it's um, it's just what do Christians need to know about the Bible? The Bible is extremely important. I wanted to, to to tell you a few things. I told Cindy that I thought I would tell you a little bit about um, some of my ministry before I came to the to the uh, Culver City Church of God. Um, it was very Bible-based. And she said, well, you should show them the two pictures that I have in the, in the uh, hall. And I, at first, I didn't know what she was talking about. And then I remembered there's a, there's a picture where, where I'm about a, a one-year-old um, boy, and I don't remember the, the time. But I'm standing there in a, in a, in a wool suit. <laughs> I remember the wool suits and a Bible. And I know I was at my grandfather's church. And, um, and so I grew up hearing the Bible and believing that the Bible was the, the source of our understanding of God in so many ways. Um, my mother had accepted Christ as a little girl, even though she was in a Mormon family, she had gone to a church, and she married my father after the uh, Korean War. Um, and and they got married and moved to, uh, to Whittier. And my father worked most of the time, day and night. My mother was a, a young woman who was really trapped at home um, about a year and a half after they were married. I was born, so, so at least she had a, well, no, she was trapped at home with the baby. And, you know, she couldn't drive. She knew some neighbors that she'd met, and she knew people at church. But my mother was a new Christian, and she was reading the Bible. And so what she did was she got the Egermeyer storybook and she would read it so she would know it was in the Bible and she would read it to me. And so uh, and a couple years later, I had a little sister that came along and she would read that, that, those stories to us. And, uh, and like I said, as she was learning them, we were learning them and she would explain to me what they meant. So it was very important at an early age for me to know the Bible. My grandmother was a great teacher and she also encouraged me to, to uh, learn the Bible. When I was at the, um, when I was in high school, I decided that I wanted to go to Zeus Pacific College. It was the Church of God College, and it was kind of local. And I wanted to go there and study the Bible, and I wanted to, uh, was to be a, a minister. And so I went to uh, Azusa, and I, I studied Bible, um, and I studied um, other things that were related to the ministry and I, a minor in Greek and a minor in Hebrew so I could read the Bible in the, in the original sources and um, studied for four years very hard, learned a lot, had some really good professors. During that time I was ministering at the Whittier Church. I taught the um, young kids and the junior high when I was in high school there and in college I went back and taught the, the high school kids and we studied the Bible. I was the uh, youth minister. So we studied the Bible on Sundays, we studied on Wednesdays. And we did all kinds of other things too. But those students were, those, those, those church kids really um, learned the Bible. Uh, two of them became ministers, three of them did min missionary work. One of them I think is a saint, she married my cousin. And um, they have four good Christian young people. Uh, one of them is already heading for the ministry. but. Um, when I, when I uh, graduated from college, I still felt that I, I knew Hebrew 
kind of like you know math, but I wanted to really know it. So I moved to a, a kibbutz in Israel where they would teach me to speak Hebrew. For a year I was there studying that and seeing the country and working really hard six days a week as one does in Israel every day but Saturday. Um, and then I returned and uh, was substituting and was, was called by the Bellflower Church of God to be a, a, a youth minister, an assistant pastor. And so I went there and for a year and a, about a year and a half I, I was uh, um, studying at Fuller Seminary and I was um, substituting in the high schools and working at the church there. Um, at Fuller, what I studied was the languages. So more of the Hebrew and the Greek, but also the Babylonian and Assyrian and Akkadian and, and a, lot of, a lot of languages that will just sound like noise to you. Um, but they were the languages that were there before Hebrew. And, so, and, and by studying the stories that they had before the Bible was written um, and, and that, that world that the Bible came from, that Abraham came out of, and that, um, that eventually the, the, uh, the people were taken away back to Babylon and then to Persia, um, I felt like I was getting a, a better understanding of Scripture. Um, in 1984, the pastor at Bellflower resigned, and um, the people asked me to be the pastor. Um, so I, I took that call, and I knew that the people I, that, that were there were very interested in the Bible. And so besides doing the pastor things that were there, I was still going to school. And when I finished at Fuller, I went to UCLA to study four more years of, of those languages and, and more about the Bible. Um, but we studied the Bible on Wednesday nights. And what I did was I translated the... the uh, the Bible through. So we started with Genesis and we would do the New Testament so, so that we'd do one book at a time and, and I would translate it so that, so, that we, so that I would really understand it and we would study it. And we had a, a, a large group for, for 13 years. Did that for 13 years. At the end of 13 years, it was time for me to go and it just happened that we were finished with the last book in the Bible. I had all of those translations on the computer but they all got lost at first I was pretty upset and sad and then I thought you know it's best that they be lost because they were just for for teaching they weren't something you could walk around and read um, the it was a, it was a, a wonderful thing to be able to do that in 1996 was when I was done there and um, pastor hooker invited me to come over and be assistant pastor and to uh, and at that time I was teaching full time. Um, all of that to tell you that if I were to do that again now, I wouldn't do that because as wonderful of a thing of it was for me to go through that, and as as many people that were there who just worked all the way through the Bible in those years and group people that came in and and went out, it was a, it was a good thing. Um, and it wasn't just that we studied the Bible like an academic professor. You know, we talked about how it got into our hearts and what it meant and, and, and how to live as Christians and all the different things that we found there. So, so that was exciting. But what I realized, of course, is that, that you don't have to do that to, to be a Christian. And so the question is, what do we need to know about the Bible? to be a Christian. How do we understand the Bible? And, and there's a little bit of complexity here, um, you know, because the Bible is 66 different books, really, and they're, they're difficult for, our, for us because they were written a long time ago, between 1000 BC and 100 AD. That was a long time ago. People didn't think like we think. And we can't think like they thought. Um, it was written by people who understood God in very different ways, uh, with different assumptions of God, different beliefs, and, and yet God has seen fit that we might receive that, those words that were, that were um, inspired by God's Holy Spirit that we still read today. Now, 
the, prob the problems that we have in understanding the Bible, I've thought a lot about this um, as I work with high school kids, and I learned that there's very few, there are very few students now, even my top students, who have read the Bible or who really go to church or know the Bible stories. Ten years ago, a lot of them did. So things are changing. But one of the things that I realize is that it's very difficult because of the assumptions that we make as people. We're a people of the Enlightenment. We're a people of science. We're a people of history. And we believe that, that uh, we believe in all of those facts. And so when we read the Bible, we go back and read the Bible trying to fit it into our science and our history. And of course, those are things that the writers of the Bible didn't think about or care about at all. They were trying to tell us who God was and how, what God wanted us to do and, and how to believe. And they use all different kinds of ways that people back then used to communicate. They didn't have the, the same, they didn't have stories like we have. It started off with a lot of, of, uh, of mythology. Um, not the Bible, but that's what people learned. The other kinds of, of, of literature that we see in the Bible also was the way people uh, read. That's what they understood. That's how they, they saw, saw things. Um, we believe that all writing, I mean modern people, that all writing is divided between fiction and nonfiction. And the world is more and more getting this way. You know that's how the library books are. There's the fiction books. Those are the pretend books. Those are the books that are literature. And then there's the nonfiction. These are the real books. The books that are true. The ones that tell the exact history and find out the little things that might be right or wrong and tell you which ones are exactly right. These are the ones that, that explain science and tell us where, how, how somehow the world got here, right? And, and how all the different things. And, and it's very powerful stuff, science. We have antibiotics. We have all kinds of great things because of science. We understand better the world that we live in. We, uh, and history also. We understand very much better what happened in the past and, and what happened in the Bible times. We can do that better. Those weren't concerns of the people that wrote the Bible. And so therefore, when we go back and expect those things to be in the Bible, we get very confused. There's a book that I have my students read by Charles Dickens, and it's called Hard Times. And in that book, there's this teacher, and, and they, they are telling the people that what they have to do, the students, is to just learn facts. They don't want poetry. They don't want any nice ideas, any, any, any imaginary things, just facts. And you know, that's, just, that's the school we're, I'm going to now. That's how school is now. They don't want literature anymore. I'm, I have the best job at Whittier High School. I get to teach the literature to kids that want to learn it. The other English classes learn nonfiction, how to write, how to, how to do things that they think is going to help them for jobs. They don't learn how to think the way literature teaches. They don't learn how to teach, how to learn the way the Bible teach, teaches. And so it's harder for them to, to understand. Now, there are some things when we read the Bible that we need to know. We need to know the basic truth about the Bible and about God and about the gospel. Okay, so, so starting with that, we need to know that as we read the Bible so we don't get confused. And most of all, we need to trust the Holy Spirit to lead us and to help us and to show us what it is that we need to know. And also to keep us out of um, left field or right field when we're supposed to be in the, um, at the home plate. Okay, so let's start with what the gospel is. That's, that is truth with a capital T. Okay, now what I mean by that is that the truth is in the gospel. Now, in John 1, and I'm not going to go through it in detail, um, but you know it. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Okay, this Word is the idea of of God 
to call a people to um, to make them his people to redeem them from their sin and to give them life in the kingdom of God that's what the word is and that's what became flesh and that's what Jesus is okay he's the word made flesh now so we know that God created the world that's what we know these are the truths God loved the world and particularly loved his creation mankind God revealed himself to people in history in various ways over time little by little the Jewish people came to believe that there's only one God and he was to be worshipped by praise by living a moral life um, Jesus was the physical manifestation of God's presence the living word and the idea um, this idea with Jesus comes the opportunity to enter the kingdom of God to live in a spiritual relationship with God through Jesus Jesus died on our sin died for our sins he was raised again he's made a He's made available to those who believe in him, his spirit to guide us and to connect us with God who calls us to live a holy life. A holy life is a life that is God-centered and displays the fruit of the Holy Spirit, which is the love of God and the love of people. The Bible is not the Logos word of God. Jesus is the word of God. The Bible is... Do you remember this song? When I was little, I learned it. And it's true. The B-I-B-L-E, yes, that's the book for me. I stand alone on the word of God, the B-I-B-L-E. The Bible is the word of God in the sense that it's God's message to us. And we read it with the help of the Spirit to understand God's messages, his word to us. In the Church of God, it's our, the, the Bible is our rule of faith, along with God and Christ's presence with us through the Holy Spirit. The Bible was written, again, in a, in a, a non-scientific age, by wise men who knew the things about God, the things that matter. They're not historical documents, although they're based in history. They're not philosophical treatises, although there's a lot of philosophy in them. They're not scientific facts that because we live in a spiritual kingdom. And that's what this, the scripture brings us into. The Bible is this library of ancient texts, books about the truth of God, conveyed in many different types of literature and different literary forms. And the truth was conveyed primarily through stories. To understand the Bible, we have to learn the stories. What do we need to know? We need to know the stories. We need to know the stories of Jesus that we sang about. We need to know the stories about the patriarchs and the stories in the Bible. Not because they're history, but because they teach us who God is and how he loves us and who we are in God's, in God's kingdom. There's a list of things that you should know about the Bible. Again, the stories, the words of Je the stories about Jesus and the words of Jesus the teaching of Paul, the stories in the Old Testament that show how God revealed himself to the people of Israel and how that applies to us, the words of warning and encouragement in the prophets and the, in, in the apocalyptic literature, the Psalms that we share with the ancient believers in God. These stories convey the truth about God and man in the way that our ancestors in the faith understood God. These books were written for people in a way that the people of that time understood them. They're not filled with secret messages that only people in the future were supposed to know about. They were written in a way that people understood then for people that, that were reading them. The original readers understood the books of the Bible. To, uh, to new Christians, they seem like what they are in some senses. Very ancient Near Eastern ways of thinking and types of stories. As we read the Bible, and I'd like to look at a few passages. Um, you know, one of the things that we're doing on Wednesday night is we're going with, through the questions. Uh, what's something you noticed for the first time? What questions did you have? Was there anything that bothered you? 
What did you learn about loving God? What did you learn about loving others? Those are fundamental questions that apply to the stories and to the things that we're reading in the Bible. That along with prayer and seeking God's presence are the way to, to study the Bible. I want to look at just a few places. Genesis 1. I don't know if Genesis 1 is going to pop up up there. Um, it's not because I didn't ask them to put that up. So here's this, the, the story. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth, earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that light, and it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. You know this story. The people who first read this story would have realized that it was revolutionary. Because we have the stories about how the world was created that were around in where, where Abraham came from. They were around a thousand years before Abraham was alive. And the stories were all pretty much the same. They worked this way. There are these gods. The gods are the gods of uh, the moon god, the, the, the stars, the sun god, the, the uh, uh, weather gods, all of these gods. And they would fight with each other because gods do that, you know. And so what would happen in, in almost all of the creation stories throughout that land is that the gods would fight and accidentally the world got made. That's right. That's how it happened. And, and then there's all this mess up. And think, different things happening happen depending on the, on the story. But what happens is that accidentally men get made. And so now you've got this accidental world that's just being held together because the gods are, are fighting. And at one time, one God is doing more. And, and, and you've got to make sure you know which God to worship and to sacrifice to. Because if you don't, then things are going to go haywire. And the world's going to fall apart. And man's going to get destroyed again. The gods were always destroying man. They're in the stories too. Okay? But man was an accident. And so when we read this story, we get it. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Or, and then he tells how he did it. In order. On purpose. And look at, and look at what, what he does. He creates all those gods. The sun. The moon. All those, thing, all those gods out there. No. God created them. On the first day he creates these gods. The next day he creates these gods. Okay. And he divides things. And God's in charge. There's not chaos up there. God created order. There's chaos now because of sin. Someday there'll be order again. In the, in the other stories, it was the opposite. They thought things came out of chaos and now we've got to sacrifice to the gods and keep it in order because things are going to fall back into chaos pretty soon. That sounds kind of like science, doesn't it? I won't go there, though. Okay. Um, going on to, to Genesis 12, very quickly. This is where we begin to see God reaching out. We, won't, we don't have time to talk about Adam and Eve. Okay. The man... And the woman. We, we give them names, but their name is man and woman. <laughs> um, now the Lord had said to Abraham, Get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house to a land that I will show you, and I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who curse you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And wait till you hear this part. So Abraham did that. He left his family. In the ancient world, and still if you go over to the ancient world today, <laughs> little groups are what people believe that they're a part of. A little group. Okay? And they mostly hate those of the other little groups, except some of their kind of their friends. Okay? That was the world of the Bible. And Abraham is with his little group, and God says, Come out of there, come with me, I'm going to show you a new land, and I'm going to bless you and make your See the multitude. This is an old man. And he believes God. And it comes true. That's one type of literature that's in the Bible. If you go to Psalm 137, we'll look at a whole different type of literature. These are very short. I'm making them very short. This is a psalm, one of the last ones of the psalms. It came late. Because the psalms are largely from the time that the, the uh, temple was in Israel. 
This is after uh, the temple's destroyed in, uh, in, in, the fifth, in the 500s. The first group was dragged out of Jerusalem. The leaders were taken to Babylon. Another 50 years later, the rest of Jerusalem would be destroyed. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down. Yes, we wept, and we remembered when we remembered Zion. We hung our harps upon the willows in the midst of it. For there, those who carried us away captive asked us for a song. And those who plundered us requested mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget its skill. If I do not remember you, let my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth. If I do not exalt Jerusalem above my chief joy, remember, O Lord, against the sons of Edom, the day of Jerusalem, who said, raise it, raise it, to its very foundation. Edom sided with the Babylonians. O daughter of Babylon, who are to be destroyed? Happy the ones who repays you as you have served us. Happy the ones who who takes and dashes your little ones against the rock. Doesn't sound like a Christian message, does it? It was despair. But out of that captivity to Babylon really comes the faith of the Jewish people. While before they were in exile, the people were still worshiping false gods. After they were taken to Babylon and after the Persians come in and, and, and destroy Babylon um, and they send the, the exiles back to Jerusalem is when we have the, the, the Judaism we think of and it was in that milieu that Jesus Christ came. I would just refer you to the parables of Jesus. We don't have time to look at some but the prodigal son prodigal son who Jesus in talking to the Pharisees and the scribes who, who really the Pharisees really did love God and they really didn't want things to change from the way that they liked to love God and Jesus was messing up stuff for them and so they so he tells them the stories about the lost coin because they were mad because Jesus is hanging out with tax collectors and sinners that don't follow the law and eating with them so they're mad and Jesus tells them that about the woman that loses the coin and finds it. About the sheep that was lost and was found. And how that was how God cared about those people who were the tax collectors and the sinners. And the prodigal son was a jab back at the Pharisees. Because remember there was the older boy who said, Hey, why are you giving him the fatted calf? I've served you all these days. I'm the one that you should care about, not him. And the father said, ah, you've always been my son. But this one was lost, and now he's found. Well, the end of the Bible, we pick up the story again, and we see um, an apocalyptic vision of the end, and the new Jerusalem, and the new kingdom that's made real, that we're in now through Jesus and his Holy Spirit. Would you just pray with me? Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus Christ, and for his sacrifice, for your word made flesh. Thank you for your Holy Spirit that teaches us truth. And thank you for your scriptures that also teach the truth. And I pray that you would Teach us to be able to read them and to see you in the stories and to be encouraged and to, to be diligent seekers of you and study to show our worthy. Father, we ask your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we just go.